Thanks for the opportunity to speak here and um, for coming to the talk. Um, and um, this is one of those rare moments where I'm actually going to start a talk by stating a theorem. Um, and you know, in case this concerns you, I will then um, spend some portion of the talk explaining background and motivation for the theorem. I'm not just going to state a theorem and, and give you a proof. Um, so the theorem is, um, what am I going to need? I'm going to need m a compact manifold. And n some integer greater than or equal to 3. I'm going to have a homomorphism from the group SLNZ to the diffeomorphism group of the manifold. And then I'm going to have two conclusions. First is if the dimension of m is less than or equal to n minus 2, then the image of this map is finite. Um, and this you should think of as a triviality kind of statement. We're doing dynamics here. And dynamics is about iterating maps infinitely often. So if your image is finite, there are no interesting dynamics. Um, it's also true that you can't really hope for any sharper control than this. Um, and the second is that if rho of s len z preserves a volume form and dimension of m is less than or equal to m minus 1, then we get the same conclusion. Then rho of gamma is still finite. Um, so that's a theorem that we proved about a year ago. Um, and you know the first obvious question is, well, why did you prove the theorem um, when I state it like this? And so you know, first remark is that this was conjectured by Zimmer. in 1983. So that's one reason to prove a theorem. Um, I want to give you better reasons than that to prove a theorem. Um, um, the second remark is somehow two examples. One is that you know, S L N Z, these are n by n integer matrices of determinant 1. This acts on Rn preserving Zn. So we get rho from S L N Z into diff of the n torus. And just because these are determinant one matrices, you're volume preserving here. So the second statement is sharp. And I don't know why I always put these in the wrong order, but the first statement is also sharp. Um, all of S L N R acts on the projective space of R N or the m minus 1 sphere, however you see fit to think about it. And so, you know, so both statements are sharp. Um, you might wonder, you know, OK, if I look at S L N Z sitting inside of S L N R and look at the actions here, you have to convince yourself that those aren't volume preserving. Otherwise, the statement of the theorem would be wrong. Um, but, but it's relatively easy to do. So, you know, so, so the statement is, you know, it's been a conjecture for some time. It's sharp. Maybe there's some reason to think about it. Um, I now want to start putting it in, you know, sort of slowly putting it in a bit more context to give you a better motivation for why we thought about it. And after that, I hope at the end to tell you some ideas towards the proof. Um, so, you know, what, what are we really thinking about here? We're really thinking about G being a Lie group. Um, and, you know, my example for today will be SLNR, um, but I'll say a few things more about it later. And gamma in G is always going to be a lattice. By which I mean it's discrete, and the Haar measure of G mod gamma is finite. And here, the example can be, e.g., S len Z and S len R. And to give you one idea of what we're really after, um, you know, there are lots of lattices in these Lie groups. Um, 
I'll say more about what they all can look like in certain contexts a little later in the talk. But um, the theorem holds, more or less is stated, for gamma any lattice in SLNR, and not just for SLN z. Um, if you don't believe me that there are other lattices, you could take finite index subgroups. You can also do other constructions, all of which involve a tiny bit of arithmetic. Um, and this I should say something more about. The three of us proved this in 2016. If G mod gamma is compact, um, for this audience, I'll just say it's an exercise to figure out why this one's not co-compact. Um, um, if you're an analyst, maybe it's not an exercise, but it's still worth thinking about. Um, um, depending on what kind of analyst. I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, that theorem really more or less as stated was proved in 17. And then um, the three of us had to recruit some support, um, some sort of algebraic support to um, finish the problem with a preprint that, you know, um, I'll claim is, you know, going to appear in, in 2018, and probably I'm being optimistic um, um, because it's about 80 pages long and we're rewriting it right now. Um, there are some real difficulties here that occur that are technical that I'm not going to get into today. Um, for an advertisement, if I actually entertain you for a full hour on Wednesday, there's an informal group action seminar in which I will tell you more about the proof if you come. Um, uh, general case of general lattice in SLNR for now. For, for now, um, I'll tell you a little bit more now about what's true if G isn't SLNR. Um, so this really belongs in a more general framework, and I'll tell you a few things about that. You know, more generally, you might want G to be a simple Lie group. Um, I don't know how much to say. Possibly higher dimension. Yeah, I mean, that's the point. You don't have yeah. In higher dimension. In higher, in higher dimension. I, I, I will come back to that. The answer is you can. Um, the answer is that there's still sort of a conjectural, uh -huh. oh, let's put it this way. There's a not quite conjectural classification available even in higher dimensions. Um, and I'll come back to that in probably five minutes, maybe. Seven minutes. Um, so, 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 I will answer that question. I, ha I haven't yet. It's fair enough. Um, so, more generally, if G is a simple Lie group, um, um, you know, if you don't like these objects, I guess you know these standard examples to think about are groups of matrices preserving an orthogonal form, um, groups of matrices preserving a unitary form, groups of symplectic matrices. Depending on what sort of algebraic object you like, you get different examples. And you know these objects are completely classified. There's one other thing I want to know about G, which is I want to know that the rank of G. I want to know what the rank of G is, and this is by definition the dimension of the maximal subgroup A and G that's diagonalizable over R. So again. Everybody in the room either already knows this or has no idea what I'm talking about. So I'll just say that for SLNR, obviously I have the diagonal matrices, but since they're determinant one, that's an n, n minus one dimensional collection of matrices. Um, and the only thing that surprises experts maybe is that I want this over R instead of over C. Um, but I really want over R for this talk. Um, um, and then, you know. There is a theorem, you know, there's a theorem slash a conjecture for G simple rank G greater than or equal to 2 and gamma in G a lattice. Um, why am I not telling you what it is? Because I then have to tell you what numbers replace these two numbers here. And it's 
just a little bit of algebra to compute what the numbers should be. Um, the other thing I'm hiding by not telling you what the numbers are is that it is still very much the case that for SLNR and SP2NR, our results are sharp. For other groups, there's some still difficulties getting sharp results. Um, and so, 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 so I, you know, I'm, I'm hiding a little bit there that our results are only sharp for the examples I happen, I happen to be talking about. Um, um, so, yes, I do want to say a little bit about prior results. I'm going to flip the order on this from what's in my notes. Um, so, one reason Zimmer conjectured this, no, it doesn't quite look like a reason, you know, it's, um, you know, Zimmer proved this if rho of gamma preserves, say, an affine connection, um, that's a really strong assumption. Um, so, and, and this isn't about 84. I mean, the paper is in 84. He may actually have proved it before he made the conjecture. Um, uh, why is this the strong assumption? It's because the, 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 the group of automorphisms of an affine connection are a finite dimensional Lie group. Um, and so rather than looking at an infinite dimensional target, you're looking at a uh, finite dimensional target. It's still not a trivial thing to prove. Um, another example of something that was proved before is Cantat proved this if M is Kähler and rho of gamma is biholomorphic. That's still a setting where the automorphism group is um, is, is relatively nice object, and that took till 2005. Um, so there's been some progress, but it's been slow going. Um, the case in which there was the most dramatic progress that made it seem most believable that something was going to happen is you can do the following thing, right? In, in, the, in, the, in the theorem, I've got, you know, two numbers basically running around, the, the, the size of the group and the size of the manifold. Um, and I want the, if the manifold's small relative to the group, I want to say there are no actions. One way you could start parameterizing this is if you you know, start working one dimension at a time. So you could say, okay, let's look at manifolds of dimension one and see what we can prove. Um, and the fact is that for, even in this case, you know, we're here, you know, we're looking at rho from gamma to diff S1. Um, there's only one interesting compact manifold. Um, I will say that this problem, for those who like to think about manifolds with boundary, the problem just gets easier if you give yourself a boundary. Um, um, in this case, um, Whitney Morris had a proof. I'm going to lie slightly um, and say that this worked with if G mod gamma is not compact. Um, he actually needed something a little bit stronger than that. And then simultaneously, more or less, Gis and Berger and Monod did the general case in about 98. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to play the game this way, next step is dimension of m being 2. Um, and in this case, I want to have rho from gamma to diff of some surface. Um, and we're going to make this volume preserving because that's the only case in which there are any results before our work. And in this case, Franks and Handel And Polterovich independently proved this result. The papers actually, the papers appeared on archive almost simultaneously, but appear in print. I think one's in 2001 and the other's in 2004. And so I'm just sort of picking a number out of my hat when I say 2002. They, they really did these things independently and at the same time. Um, what? This is for any, you know, these are all gamma in G rank G greater than or equal to 2. And here again, they need G mod gamma not compact. So all of these are for the general case of the theorem. Um, the volume across 1 to is plus SL2. Yeah, you can have SL2. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I, I, I have to. I really have to assume this rank being higher. So SL2, SL2 is ruled out. Lattices in SL2 can be free groups, and then you can't say anything. Um, yeah. Um, if you if you if you know enough about numerology, you know you, you can say that you can see that this actually proves the theorem. For SL3Z, um, and 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 that's sort of the the, the status quo um, when things really you know did sort of other than the slightly later <coughs> result of Kanta in a special case things more or less did freeze at that point in history um, until we did our work, um, you know. It 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 uh, it was surprising. To everyone, including us, um, <laughs> um, and it's also very surprising that the non-compact case is much harder. And I hope to say a tiny bit of that before the end of today's lecture. And certainly, we'll say more about it on Wednesday for anyone who comes. Um, um, so, so not to do with non-linear harmonic maps. Or? No, there are no harmonic maps in the proof, um, which is neither a good nor a bad thing. But. Um, um, I, I'm still sort of teasing you with this, right? Because you know, surely these partial results are not a good reason to have made a conjecture in 1983. Um, and, and, and so I want to tell you more about the real reason for the conjecture. And um, so that really starts with some results of Margulis. Margulis's arithmeticity theorem is the one I'll tell you first. And again, I'm lying very slightly. Um, so if I have G as simple Lie group, and the rank of G is greater than or equal to 2. And gamma in G is a lattice. What he proves, more or less, is that then there exists a number field K such that, well, gamma is, roughly speaking, the O of K points. And here, you know, O of K is the k integers, um, where roughly speaking means up to sort of finite index subgroups, maybe up to conjugation. Um, but it really says that the only way I get lattices in these groups are by some variant on the obvious construction of just taking integer points. Um, and this is from, I guess, 74. And in this room, I have to mention that this was conjectured by Selberg and Piotrowski Shapiro. Um, um, so this was not out of the blue. What was a little bit more out of the blue was how he proved this, which I won't state quite precisely. Um, but he proved something that's called super rigidity. Um, anyone who knows Margulis, he's not enough of an egomaniac to have called his own theorem super rigidity. That was not that. The, na the name is Mostow's fault, not Margulis's. Um, um, and what this does. I'm just going to say it vaguely. This classifies maps from gamma into, let's say, GLNC. So it classifies linear representations of my group. And it classifies them completely um, in a way that's slightly too complicated to explain in a talk if it's not where you're headed. Um, but I will state a corollary that's sort of a corollary that more directly inspires the theorem, which says that you know if gamma and SLNR is a lattice, then rho from gamma to let's say GL and minus 1C has rho of gamma finite. So this is sort of a linear version of that theorem. It says that if you know if I look at low dimensional linear representations, they're all trivial or at least finite. This is sort of saying the same thing for a certain type of nonlinear representation. Um, and now I finally get around to answering Akshay's question, um, which is that, so you know, the theorem corresponds to the corollary. This theorem corresponds to something that still goes by the rubric of the Zimmer program, um, where the goal is to classify you know, rho from gamma to diff m, where gamma in G is a lattice, 
rank of g is greater than or equal to 2, and and you know m is just any compact manifold. Um, and there really is a conjectural picture, um, but it's sufficiently complicated that it doesn't. It's not something I can put in a talk. And I will say that, um, you know, my apologies to the many people who've heard this joke before. But you know, if you look at Zimmer's you know 1983 paper where he lays this out, um, he says something like this, and he reveals the fact that he was going to become a university president later in life by making statements that are impossible to prove either true or false. So you know, he makes. <laughs> Uh, That's usually a lawyer. <laughs> I think it applies equally well to university presidents, many of whom are lawyers. But um, but um, the um, he makes a conjecture very clearly and explicitly that conjectures this theorem, including you know all the other cases I've mentioned. But when he starts talking about this, he does a very effective job of both laying out a possible conjectural picture and hedging his bets. Um, so you know, I don't want to go into what the conjectural picture is. It is a little bit more complicated now than it was at the time, but there, there really is a conjectural picture where I think what we have now is a complete conjectural so picture. Corvette changed the, uh, in, there's a rank one yes. super rigidity. Does that fit into the Zimmer program? Um, so I come back to this several times later in today's talk and Wednesday's, is there's, there's an extra phenomena about higher rank groups. What Peter's referring to is there's, there's the isometry group of the quaternionic hyperbolic has this same theorem true of it by work of Corlett and Grum of Shane. Um, but yeah, it's real rank one. It's not higher rank, so it, we can still classify the representations. Hiding somewhere in this proof is another phenomenon discovered by Margulis, which is that in higher rank, these lattices have the property that all of their normal subgroups are either finite or finite index. And that's not true of the rank one ones. And hiding, <coughs> we don't quite use it, but we use something related to it. Um, in, in a way that I still won't, yeah. It, it's a complicated thing that's still being understood. Um, Is it important to have diffeomorphism for those homeomorphisms? So what I'll say is the proof of the theorem uses diffeomorphisms at essentially every step. There are results for homeomorphisms, including this one by Woody Morris. I didn't mention that works for homeomorphisms. These work, don't work for homeomorphisms. So, and there are other partial results for homeomorphisms in both, um, you know, to cover both low and high dimensions. Etienne G. and Shmuel Weinberger keep telling me that the theorem should be true for homeomorphisms. And you know, for, for, for me, working without a derivative is hard, but those guys really know what a, what a, what a, what a topological manifold is. And so if they think it's true, it probably is. Um, 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 so I do want to say one word about why this is a natural generalization of this. And, and, and it's, 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 it's just the following silly observation. And if I have, you know, rho from gamma to diff m, then I can look at d rho of gamma at a point x. And that gives me a map from the tangent space at x to the tangent space at rho gamma of x. And these things compose over something that looks like a group law or a pseudo group law. So you know this gives me some sort of nonlinear representation that looks like the linear representation. And there's a theorem called co-cycle super rigidity. Um, that says something about this nonlinear representation that, again, I don't quite want to tell you what it is. It just generalizes super rigidity. But I will tell you a corollary of it that will come back later. You know, It will be the same flavor of corollary. It's the low dimensional case of the corollary where things are easy to state, where the conjectural picture is clean and things are easy to state. So. What do I want to say? And again, I only do this in the special case, so the numerology is clear. So gamma and epsilon r, n greater than or equal to 3. This is a lattice. M, a compact manifold. <coughs> with the dimension of m less than or equal to n minus 1. And rho from gamma 
to diff m. And the statement then is for any gamma invariant measure mu on m gamma preserves a Ramanian metric g. And I wanted to say that before I make people confused. Everyone knows what a Ramanian metric is. What everyone doesn't know is what is a mu measurable Ramanian metric. Um, um, if, if, if I actually had a Ramanian metric, we'd be done. Um, but, um, and so from the point of view, what Zimmer was actually conjecturing and conjecturing the theorem I'm now erasing is he was conjecturing a regularity result. He was conjecturing that, you know, he produced a measurable Ronnie metric, at least in this case where I said things were volume preserving. Um, and he just wanted you to prove that the measurable Ronnie metric was smooth. Um, there are all kinds of people in this room who study various forms of regularity theory. And, you know, one could hope to do that. It turns out to be very, very difficult to do that directly. And we don't, in fact, do that directly. Um, it's not, it's not, well, the conjecture was motivated as a regularity result. The proof is not via proving a regularity result. That notion is what we think it is. Right? It's new Right. It means that the, you know the GIJs, you know, say, you know, GIJs are measurable, and mu almost everywhere to find. Um, so it means it means what you think it means. Um, the second thing you should you, you should know is that it, it does mean um, I, it is you know non-degenerate and positive definite almost everywhere. Otherwise, you might worry I was taking a, a worse object than I'm taking. But the second remark about it is, G doesn't define a distance. Because it's just a measurable object, you know, how do you define distance? You take infimum over lengths of paths. It might be the case that for every path I take between a pair of points, that length is infinity. Because it's just measurable. I'm not, you know, and it really is. It comes out of the proof that it's just measurable with absolutely no regularity conditions. So you uh, have a control. Yeah, no. So in the case where mu is the volume form, mm -hmm. you know that the volume that the metric defines is the volume form. Ooh. So that's a very strong non-degeneracy. In other cases, you don't have anything nearly that strong. But, but, but in, in that case, you do know that, which is very strong, but it's still not bounded away from 0. Um, um, yeah, so you don't, you don't, you know, and it's not bounded away from either 0 or infinity. You could, you could have such an object that gave every curve length infinity. You could also have such an object that gave every curve length 0. Um, working with it directly is not a practical thing to do. Um, um, and I should also say, maybe remark 3, is that if g is say smooth or C0 or even bounded, the theorem follows. Um, and when I say the theorem follows, I mean that Zimmer knew in around 1983 that the theorem followed. Um, you know, it, the, the problem is that it doesn't have any of any reasonable regularity conditions on it at all from most points of view. Um, you know, and these things are roughly equivalent, just to motivate what I'm going to say next, this is roughly equivalent to saying that, you know, d rho of gamma, you know, and if it's c infinity, this would be always have norm 1. Um, if it's c0 or bounded, it's just saying that the norm of the derivative is bounded at every point. Um, you know, so, so if we knew this, we'd be in good shape. We don't know that. Um, and the question is sort of what do we know? Um, you know, and again, you know, I really think Zimmer, Zimmer spent 10 years thinking he was a differential geometer after proving this result while trying to prove, while trying to, to finish proving it using sort of differential geometry regularity techniques and not getting very far. Um, but you really want to, to, to instead be a dynamicist to prove the theorem as it turns out. Um, 
I'm confused. If you think we have a number of SL and A acting on A and A and not ZM, what happens? There are no invariant measures. <laughs> so, 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 so it seems. Which example? On the modulus of ZM or? On RPN, on the projective space. On that space, there turn out to be no invariant measures. Okay, but on A and not ZM. Then there's invariant volume, but that's above the dimension in which the corollary says anything. Um, yeah, no, no worries. Um, um, so I want to give you a slightly bastardized standard definition in dynamical systems. I'm going to say that rho from gamma to diff m. Well, let me do one other thing first. So, you know, all of these gammas are finitely generated. So, you know, gamma, elements of gamma can be written in words in some set S, which is finite. And this gives me a length of gamma, which is the word length, length in S. And we're just going to need that. We need, we need the notion of the length of a group element in several places. And um, the next definition is that if I have this row from gamma to diff m, and this definition makes sense for any finitely generated group, um, I'm going to say this has zero first Lyapunov exponent. <coughs> for a measure mu, if whenever I take a sequence of elements in gamma with L of gamma i going off to infinity, um, There's a number I'm going to compute a priori depends on a base point. It's the limit as this length goes off to infinity of the log of the norm of the derivative divided by the length of the element. And I want that to be 0. So what does this say? This says that the stretch factor along any sequence of elements, the, you know, the asymptotic stretch factor along any sequence of elements is, is, is 0. Um, if you don't like this and never seen anything like it, um, and this, this is true for mu almost every x, for those who are still wondering why I said it was respect, with respect to mu, um, this is sort of a, a, a nonlinear analog of, of, of saying that the, you know, eigenvalues are all with unit modulus for a matrix. Um, and I should say that the notion of Lyapunov exponent actually did show up in Margulis' original proof of superrigidity. So, um, um, so that's a property that a group action might have that, you know, I said if the derivatives were bounded, we knew we were OK. And this is saying, well, the derivatives aren't bounded, but they at least sort of don't grow exponentially. Um, and that's going to turn out to be a key notion we need. Um, there's you know, an additional remark that says, you know, if I have a mu measurable gamma invariant Ramanian metric, g, then rho gamma has zero first Lyapunov exponent. <coughs> this remark is actually due to Hillel Furstenberg. Um, but it sort of connects things up. It says, OK, Zimmer proves we have that. That implies this dynamical condition. Um, where? Oh, inside the double bar? Derivative of rho of gamma i, or it's rather derivative of rho of gamma i at the point x. So you, you measure using a Riemannian metric? Uh, so, so I'm using, when I, when I put the norm bars, I'm, put, I'm picking a Riemannian metric, yes. but this notion doesn't depend yes. on which Riemannian metric I pick. Yes. So, um, 
What? Which role does dictum ever play? Um, this is only true for almost every point with respect to the measure. Um, the other thing that we're saying here is, you know, this is some sort of asymptotic statement, and the rate of convergence to the limit can depend on the point. Um, in general, it does. Um, and so we want to have some notion that interpolates between, um, between this sense of boundedness of derivatives and this very weak sense of not growth of derivatives. And it turns out there is one that's sort of a key notion that was introduced recently by my collaborator, Hurtado, um, in a related context, where we say that rho from gamma to diff m has sub-exponential growth of derivatives. If, well, all I really want to say here, you know, I'll write it down in symbols, but all I really want to say here is, you know, I want to say that the derivative grows along orbits more slowly than any exponential function. So if, you know, for every epsilon, there exists C epsilon such that, and now I want a statement that is uniform over the manifold. Look at D rho of gamma at the point x, but I'm souping over the manifold, and that should be less than my constant e to the epsilon, the length of my element. So this says my derivatives along the group grow very slowly. Um, or at least, you know, they grow something like a polynomial. Um, 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 and the difference between this and, you know, and the Lyapunov exponent statement is, um, you know, the difference between this statement and this statement, if you're not used to these things, is, 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 is probably much more dramatic than you think it is. Um, this really is a non-uniform almost everywhere statement, and this is a uniform everywhere statement. Um, um, so, so there's a profound difference between these. You know, and I, I want this for all gamma and gamma. Um, and now, you know, and one thing that's clear is, you know, sub-exponential growth of derivatives. If you have the uniform everywhere statement, that implies the non-uniform almost everywhere statement. So you know that direction is clear. Um, and what you want to do is go in the other direction. And the heart of the proof is, can you go in the other direction? Um, and so, um, how am I doing? Okay. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about how you can go in the other direction. The other thing I should tell you, and I'll just do this verbally right now, I'll hopefully have time to do it a little bit more detail later, is once we know that the group action has this property, we then can finish. So this really is sort of the pivot point of the proof is first you prove your group action has this property, and then you prove that's enough. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that towards the end. Um, that is also not an obvious statement, but it is, if you look at Zimmer's early papers, he was often trying to do things like this. This, you know, the, the fact that derivatives can grow despite this measurable metric existing um, really, you know, was, has been known for a long time to be part of the problem. When I talked to the people who've been working on this for a long time and told them we can prove this, they were more or less confident that we had it. Um, and they were confident. Is this, is this new strong property fee business or not? Right. It is the new strong property T business. What they were confident we had was slightly weaker statements than we have. Using a, using a very magical tool that I'll talk about in a little bit, you get very strong statements. Using things that are older, you could have gotten weaker statements. Um, you, know, you get the whole conjecture sort of from this because we have this magic tool coming from operator algebras. We would have gotten special cases that would have been significant even without that. Um, um, all right, so I want to reverse this arrow. And there's a proposition that's just a classical dynamics proposition that I've still never found this proposition in the literature. But 
I, I fully expect to find this proposition in the literature in a paper from the 50s or the 60s at some point. Um, I just haven't yet. Um, it says, OK, let's take the case where gamma is z. I'll look at you know, rho from z to diff m, where m is compact. Um, then this z action has sub-exponential growth of derivatives if and only if it has 0 first Lyapunov exponent for every invariant measure. And this really is, I mean, I haven't done this yet, so maybe I'm fudging a little too hard. But I think you could teach an introductory class on dynamical systems where you could prove this in the first month or so of the course, um, if that was what you desired to do in your course. Um, you know, what? Every. It's no, no, gamma is z. So it's gamma is z, so you have lots of them. I'm about to tell you why. Um, you have lots of invariant measures. Why is this possible to do? Is 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 that you know, because gamma is z, I have um, the following construction works. I can take measures, which we'll call mu of n and x, which is one over let's say m plus one, sum i equals zero to n. Let's pick the diffeomorphism that's the generator of z. I take the Dirac measure at f i of x. So I'm just taking orbit segments, and I'm taking Dirac measures along the orbit segments and normalizing them correctly. And then you know I can just take mu any weak star limit of any of these mu and x's, you know, with the n going to infinity. You know, I can't just take, and and this will be is invariant. So there are a lot of invariant measures in this context. Um, and what's the point of proving the proposition? The point of proving the proposition is you prove the converse. So you assume there isn't uniform sub-exponential growth. You pick a sequence of points where the orbit segments are seeing exponential growth, and you just build the corresponding measures and more or less check that you see Lyapunov exponent along those measures. Um, and everything works out relatively nicely. The one trick that confuses people when asked to do this as an exercise is that you um, you actually build the measures on the unit tangent bundle of the manifold and then push them down. Um, at some point, you need that. If you were to try and prove this as an exercise, you would realize you needed that. Yes? yes. I, th I think the issue with the literature is more that everybody proves this proposition themselves when they need it as a little proposition of limit. I mean, I've seen it. Multiple. You've seen it? OK. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I, I assume everyone knows this. I've never, actually, I've never actually read a paper where it was stated verbatim this way. Um, you know, I claim no originality here. It's not what we use. So what's the problem for us? Um, so this construction works more generally than z actions. This is more or less, you know, it's von Neumann's definition of an amenable group. It's a group where this construction works um, to give you invariant measures. Um, and, you know, gamma is not amenable in the worst possible way. So can't do this directly. You know, we can't just say, oh, I have this for z. I want it for gamma. We'll prove it for gamma. We'll be done. Um, so I'm now going to do something that I think maybe is a little unusual, but you know, somehow it's the right way for me to explain in the allotted time something more about this proof. Um, um, you run into a little bit of problems with the definition of Lyapunov exponent. It works for abelian, abelian groups. For amenable groups, I've never seen anyone work out nicely the theory of Lyapunov exponents. Um, maybe you can. 
but we actually tried at some point early in this project to do that, and it gets a little, gets, I mean, we, we stopped because it stopped being useful, so maybe you, if you worked a little harder, you could work it out, but it gets a little futsy. Um, um, so this is sort of the, the, you know, the recipe of the proof. What? It's true for ZD. You can do it for ZD. That I have checked. Um, may even be checked in some sense in the paper. Um, okay, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's fine. But um, so there are three steps in in in, in, in you know in the recipe for the proof of the main theorem, um, and I just want to you know step. This really is a recipe, so I'm going to tell you steps and ingredients. Um, Um, so, step one is prove sub-exponential growth of derivatives. Step two is find an invariant smooth Ramanian metric. And step three is show is finite. So far, I've been talking about this one, so let me just fill in the gaps on these two first. Um, this one is just Margulis super rigidity um, let's call that metric H, plus the fact that I saw M um, H is a compact Lie group. So this third step was known to Zimmer in 1983. Um, this step is the one where, you know, various special cases of it appear in various old papers of Zimmer's. Um, and I had an outline for doing it myself, too, in a different way. But here, what we really end up using is this thing that's called strong property T of Laforgue. Um, which is, you know, there's something called Kajdan's property T, which Lefort was generalizing and strengthening, which is why it's called strong property T. Um, and, you know, it, this is, um, no, no, hyperbolic groups don't have this property. So, so that's another problem for, 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 your, favorite, for your, your favorite variant of my theorem. Um, but um, I should also say this, this, is, this, is, this is Vincent, not Laurent, um, for those who keep track of their Laforgues. Um, um, and you need this plus an argument from a paper Margulis and I wrote, sort of an averaging argument we wrote in a paper in 2009. For here, you could just do Hilbert spaces. So what's the strong property? Um, property T is about unitary representations. Yeah, these things, the, the, my, 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 yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's a Hilbert space, but my representation yeah, isn't okay. unitary. Um, um, so can you just say a word? So the kind of theorem is that if you have... It really is. It's, it's, kind, it's kind of, once you put it in this context, it's kind of amusing. If you have norm growth that looks like this, then he'll still find you an invariant vector. And he'll still find you one by averaging by balls and, and you know, and, and, and the exact sort of what spectral kind of gap. It is now known due to work of Laforgue and Delasol and the lot that it's known for all higher rank lattices. It's not known for any group that's not a higher rank lattice. Um, and it is known by the first, you know, the first, the very first thing that Laforgue proves about it is it doesn't hold for any hyperbolic group. So most of the other examples we know of groups that have property T can't have this property. Um, all right, so now I want to fill in the last. What about lattice in the product of simple groups? Oh, those are, well, if, if, if you know, it'll be this more or less what you expect, which is if the simple Lie groups are rank one, it won't happen. If the simple Lie groups are all higher rank, it will happen. Um, 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 it turns out this is by far the highest, hardest part of the theorem. It um, involves, you know, sort of, you know, 
a variant on that proposition. It involves, you know, a lot of what is known as hyperbolic dynamics. The Laforgue thing, if you run it through an argument Margulis and I gave using property T in the perturbative setting, it gives you an invariant metric in exactly this setting. Um, it really is, you take, you take his input, that input, and our argument, and you just stick them together. It's, it's relatively simple to do once you have all three ingredients. Um, I mean, the hardest part of that is understanding what the hell his papers say, because they're written in this very operator algebraic language. Um, um, so um, this also oddly uses homogeneous dynamics, including important results by Marina Ratner and Nimish Shaw. Um, and then it uses some work, um, depending on what setting you're in, it uses some work of LaDrapier and Young. Or if you want better results, it uses work of Brown, Rodriguez, Hertz. And Jiron Wang. Um, so I'll tell you more about this. I'm gonna I'm gonna start telling you more about this step because you have all these ingredients here. I'm just giving you a long laundry list of of stuff we're gonna use. Um, what? Brown, Brown, my co-author Aaron Brown. Um, same, same Brown. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, yes. Um, so, um, so how do we go about doing this? You know, managed to get to where I most optimistically hope I got. So I hope I didn't go too fast for too much of the audience. Um, um, so what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you don't like working with gamma actions because gamma is a discrete group and it has absolutely no algebraic structure. SLN Z gives you the illusion that these groups have algebraic structure that you can understand. As soon as you move to a co-compact lattice, there's no algebraic structure that's worth understanding. And so you don't want to work with that. So what do you do? You just, you build a G action on a manifold that you write this way. And how do you build this? I have to tell you how G acts on this and how gamma acts on G times M. So if I take G M, and I act, say, by g prime on that and gamma on the other side. This is g prime g gamma inverse rho gamma of m. This gives you this space, which is, you know, which is has a, has a g action, and you know, the g act, you know, this space is a fiber bundle with fiber m over g mod gamma. Um, this doesn't seem to improve things at all because I complained that gamma was not amenable and G is equally not amenable and so I don't seem to have done anything myself any good. Um, what? No, oh, yeah, and the ma well, what I'm going to tell you from now to the end is about the case where gamma is compact, co-compact, because there are other difficulties when it isn't. Um, so the next thing we noticed is that you notice is that G has this thing called a Carton decomposition. Now this is completely standard fact for people who think about these objects, you know, you know, A is the diagonal matrices. You know, if I'm in SLN, Z, SLN R, this is diagonal matrices, and K is SON. And so I can also just pick a K invariant metric. Since it's compact, I can just average. I can pick a K invariant metric on G cross M mod gamma. And so what does that do for me now that I've done all of that? It gets me to exactly the case in which alone was disputing me. Um, but, um, but so if we assume gamma is co-compact, then sub-exponential growth of derivatives for gamma is equivalent to 
sub exponential growth of derivatives for g, which is equivalent to sub exponential growth of derivatives. Yeah. OK, so I have to be a little careful here and say a long TM. Um, right? There are two directions here in the tangent bundle. The directions that are along G and the directions that are along M. And I want to only keep track of my derivatives along M because my derivative along G is something I understand. We'll actually use that later in a way that I won't, I won't get into the next five minutes, no matter how hard I try. But we will use that we understand that later. Um, and again, this is along TM. Right, I have this sub-bundle, tangent bundle of this manifold contains a sub-bundle that's the tangent bundle of directions ta tangent to the fiber. Um, and so we're now, now we finally won because A is an amenable group. Um, um, A is just, you know, it's just Rn minus 1. And again, I'm going to keep assuming gamma is co-compact, because otherwise this next step becomes incredibly hard. Um, what happens is the proof of that same proposition that I guess I have since erased more or less the same proof. You need one or two extra things. Shows that there exists an A invariant measure mu on this space. And some element a and a, where the Lyapunov exponent for a and mu is positive. Same sort of argument by contradiction produces for you an a invariant measure on this space. Um, And now, yeah, if you, you know, shows if no sub exponential growth of derivatives it's the same kind of compactness argument, just shows that you have a measure with a positive Lyapunov exponent here. And the fact, which gets a little obscured by having done this induced action, is that if mu were g invariant, this contradicts Zimmer's co-cycle superrigidity theorem. <coughs> so you know, which means that the goal is promote mu to a g invariant measure keeping this positivity of the open of exponents. Maybe I should call it mu prime. So that's that sort of main thing that happens in the proof is you start with a measure that's invariant for a subgroup and you want it to be invariant for the big group. Um, and you actually do this. I'll say one more thing. You do this in two steps. First one is you just look at, you know, there's a projection from g cross m mod gamma to g mod gamma. And pi star mu is a invariant measure. on g mod gamma. And you know, we want to show it's g invariant. Um, and you, know, you think, oh, especially with a lone sitting in the audience, you think, oh, there are lots of techniques for doing this. There are a lot of techniques for taking, for studying behavior of a invariant measures on these quotients. There are a invariant measures that aren't g invariant, but there aren't so many of them. And you have you know, some hope of doing this. You know, we actually at first thought we were going to use some of Alon's work, and, and then it turned out that we used older things from homogeneous dynamics instead. And 
the lie I'm telling you here is that we change the measure. The, the trick that we play that isn't the standard trick in homogeneous dynamics is we don't actually care about this measure. We care about having some measure with some properties. And we play games where we trade the measure for ones we like better a lot. Um, and then the second step is you know show that suffices. That once the projection is invariant, so is, so is the whole measure. And this is the thing that uses this work of Aaron Brown, Federico Rodriguez Hertz, and Jiren Wang. Um, with the remark that's a, a side remark that we made much later that if you're in the special case that I've been in for the entire talk of S L and R action, you can get away not using this, but just using an older result of Le Drapier and Young that they are generalizing. Um, if you want the right result for SP2NR, you better use their result. If you want the result just for SLNR, you can use a much older result. Um, and Where is Ratner used in? Ratner is used in here. Ratner is used at step one. Basically, what we do is we take this measure and we start averaging it over unipotence. Um, when I say we replace it, we average it over unipotence to make it better. And I will say something, you know, I hope moderately detailed about that on Wednesday, if people are interested in seeing how that works. Um, so, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.